All right, I missed two minutes of the lecture. We're talking about exception handling, which is chapter 15. What is exception handling? We've seen plenty of exceptions. Now we're going to learn how to stop them from crashing our program. So we typed in a little program. This program works, but it's fraught with error. If you look at it, we have an X, we have a string, we store a value in the string, we use parsint to convert that string and store it in X, and then we store Y divided by X, excuse me, 1 divided by X into Y. There are two places where this could fail. One is if this is invalid format, like if that's a letter or something. And two is if X even, winds up being zero. Even if it were, even if that's something like 1.5. Exactly, exactly. Or even 1.0, which looks like an integer, but it's not. Okay, so run it. It's going to work, I hope. Yeah, one's reciprocal is one. All right, let's break it. 1.1. 1. 1. We're going to get a number format exception. Boom. Number format instruction it, exception. We could put a catch there. That is the name of the exception. We could, you know, click on it or, you know, do a look up on it and find out exactly what causes that exception. We could kind of guess from the name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in a try statement. Try doing this stuff. But if we run into a problem, <coughs> we better catch that error. Number format exception. And that's a data type just like anything else. So we have to give it a variable name. EX is a great variable name, right? Could be anything. And we're going to print out an error. System.out.println. Well, firstly, let's print out the exceptions description of itself. EX.get message. But that's going to look all programmerese. And so really, we'd probably comment that out after a while and just do system.out.println, you know, s plus quote space is not a valid integer, something like that. And if we were using a scanner, we'd say, please try again, and we'd put a loop, right, making sure that it works. All right, now it's not going to fail, even though this is not an integer. Or it's going to fail, but it's not going to crash the program. We're not going to see all the red text. All right, and so it ran. We're pretending the user typed in a 1.1. It caught the exception. 1.1 is not a valid integer. And here is the message. Well, that's not real good for input string 1.1. The get message did not produce anything I would want to display to the user, right? So maybe if we call to string on it, right? EX dot to string parentheses in parentheses plus a space plus EX dot get message. Maybe that'll make a better error looking, a better looking error. Yeah, number format exception for input string 1.1. Oh, and it spit that out twice. So we could get rid of the call to get message entirely. I'm going to delete that and just leave it ex.toString like that. Programmers would want to know that. The end user would not want to know that. So next thing I'm going to do is comment it out. You know, I don't want Excel to tell me number format exception. I want it to give me a better error message than that. All right, but we know that there can be other problems. Zero. And it runs again, or it fails again. By the way, it says, 
and also in this language, when they for all the exceptions, instead of using the word division, they replace it with the symbol. Yeah. Why? Is there any reason for that? Did any other languages do that? No, I don't know why. I'd rather see the word divide by zero. But I guess... Oh. I guess there's a possibility that if you've localized your application to run in French or something, the word divide would be something else. And the reason I'm thinking that is because if you do ex.get, one of the choices is get localized message, which means that you could be creating something that ran in another language. But the, so that's probably why they use a division symbol. But then, and then again, that's English, right? Yeah. And that's English, so I don't really know why. Good question. Do you, do you know any other programming languages to do that? No, I don't. All right, get rid of that. Okay, but we have another exception to handle. It runs, it generates, let's take a look. It crashed with a java.lang arithmetic exception. We have to add another catch. So, that's what I'm going to do. I could just copy it. That's the quickest way. The reason I don't have to type in the full path is because everything in java.lang is imported by default. We don't have to do import java.lang.arithmetic exception. The compiler does import java.lang.star for us. Okay, so we need one more catch. Catch. Arithmetic exception, ex. And I'm not going to bother printing it out to string. We've already seen what that looks like, so I'm just going to put system.out.println. Yeah. Division by error, division by zero error occurred. So we've made it handle both problems. I don't know of anything else that this little bit of code could do that could cause a problem. As long as we use .next or next line to store in the S. If we use next int, well next int can also throw an error. And we'd have to put the scanner statement inside a try catch, right? So we could do that if we wanted to. I think we're good enough. One thing I want to show you is I'm going to comment out these lines. Source, comment, watch and I spot it. Toggle comment, okay. The reason I'm doing that is going to, I'm going to show you the catch-all exception. In Python we did uh, try and then we did, you know, accept. That was kind of a universal exception handling. It, you did not have to specify which kind of exception. You could, but you didn't have to. So catch, parentheses, exception, ex. That's a generic exception. It'll catch any exceptions that can occur. So system.out.println. Oops, error occurred. Sorry, whatever. Yeah, now it's going to run okay. Again, but it's not going to tell you the specific error. Oops, error occurred, sorry. It is considered extraordinarily poor programming to just catch the, ex the general exception. You ought to catch the specific one you're expecting. Why? Because then the program might generate another kind of exception that you weren't expecting. And you need to know about that. You need to know why it can fail. You as the programmer need to know all the different reasons it can fail. So putting a catch with a generic exception, really bad idea. I'm showing it to you, but it's a really bad idea. So I'm going to comment that out and uncomment the other stuff.
fact, I'm going to delete that because it makes the code look messy. Okay, that's exception handling in a nutshell. When we come back on Tuesday, we may do a little bit more because we might want to write a program that opens a file and saves data to a file. And to do that, you absolutely have to add exception handling or the code will compile. This is an unchecked exception, meaning that if you handle it, great, but it's optional, right? The programmer doesn't have to add that or, or the code won't compile. I mean, you better add it or the, you know, the code will crash, but the compiler doesn't mandate it. However, the so-called checked exceptions are mandatory or the code won't even compile. All right, so I want to do a little bit more with array list. For example, I'm going to create an array list that is not an array list of integers or strings or anything like that. It's going to be an array list of objects. I need to come up with some cute little object. Class person. And every person has a first name. Every person has a last name. We're going to create a constructor for that. Now, by default, if you don't specify an access level, the access level is assumed to be public or something very close to public. Package. Everything in the package can get a hold of it. But I'm going to go ahead and specify it. So, the constructor for person is supposed to take a first name and a last name. So, first name or this dot first name equals dot fn. This dot last name is equal to ln. There, we've got an object. And let's make a two-string method so that we could print a person out super easy. So public string, two-string, parentheses, in parentheses, and it returns the first name plus a space plus a last name. And maybe we could make it even cooler than that. Okay, I, I goofed that. That should have been the, uh, the variable names. I'm going to delete all that. In fact, I'm going to use string.format. So return string.format quote person equals percent s space percent s. End quote, comma, this dot first name, comma, this dot last name. Just to test it out, I'm going to create a person and print out the, the name just to make sure it works, and then we'll use an array list. We all good? Anybody need typo help? Need me to slow down? Notice that a little warning comes up over here. Add override annotation. I can do that. The code compiles just fine without it. It helps the compiler with something. It helps the compiler know that if you type this wrong, if you called it two string, right, or if you decided to make it return something else other than a string, it would flag it as an error. Override means just replace. This method replaces one that was declared in the parent class. Now, have we typed, talked about parent classes? No, we really haven't done, um, you know, inheritance in this class. Inheritance is the idea that you can have subclasses or child classes that take the attributes of a parent class. Now, the parent class for everything in Java is just called object. And they all have a two-string method. So when you customize it, you're called, that's called overriding the two-string method. You're customizing how the two-string method works. Otherwise, all it does is print the name of the class followed by you know some kind of hashed memory address, and we've seen that. All right, 
scroll down. Let's make a person. Person B is equal to new person. Sam Bill, that's his name. And let's print them out. System dot out dot print line P. Person is equal to Sam Hill. Good deal. We are going to create an array list of people. So, array list, angle brace, person, end angle. I'm just going to call it P list for like people. Or maybe I'll call it just people. Yeah, people list. All lowercase because. That's how I want to do it today. Is equal to new array list. Parentheses in parentheses. Whoops, got that wrong. Angles and then parentheses, then a semicolon. And it's telling me it doesn't know what an array list is, so I should go up and add a Java, you know, import Java. I'm going to let NetBeans do that for me. Now I'm going to add some people to our array list. You know, I could be prompting the user for this stuff, right? Ask for the first name, ask for the last name. But I think not. Why don't I just add person P to the list? So. People list dot add P. Let's add somebody else. People list dot add parentheses new person parentheses Joe end quote comma quote Bob. Two closing parentheses and a semicolon. That's an anonymous object, right? It's never stored in a variable name. But that's okay. It can be added to the uh, to the array list just fine. And let's add one more person. People list dot add parentheses new person. You know. Susan Thomason or Susan Thomas. I don't want to use the name of somebody who's in the class, so how about, you know. Susan Doe. Just like a John Doe. All right, there we go. I want to print out everybody in that list now. I could use an index-based for loop, or I could use a for each loop. For each loop is so much easier that that's what I'm going to do. Or, parentheses, person... I better not use P because I've already got that. Person P E R. Now yeah, that looks like too much like English. Person E for element. Colon. People list. And then just system dot out dot print line E. Then you may notice that there's a little warning over here. And this is worth doing and then, and then recoiling with horror and undoing it. You can use functional operations. Alrighty. There's a style of programming called functional programming. And the idea of functional programming is that the program is supposed to be so-called stateless meaning that it doesn't have data that changes inside it, which is crazy, and that everything is a function. Well, okay. This is generating a function. But, eh, that, that's crazy. I'm going to undo that.
Shell programming is slightly beyond what I have learned so far. All right, I'm going to run it, see what it does. I'm going to take out this print line P, though, because I know that I print the person out later. All right, and it printed out our three people. So, nicely done. We've already done array, arrays of objects. Now we've done an array list. And we know the advantages of an array list. It'll grow, it'll shrink. You don't have to allocate it in advance. You don't have to set a maximum number of people. You don't have to worry about how many people are going to be added to it. Yeah, out of curiosity, whoopsie, out of curiosity, I'm going to type people list dot and see what other things come up. Equals. Equals is an important one because just like with strings and other objects, you can't say if people list equals people list too. Right? You can't just use it double equal to compare two different objects. Instead, you have to call a dot equals method. Dot clear would wipe the list out. Add all. If we wanted to add every object in one list into another, we could do that. I'm not seeing anything that I want to mess with here. So I'm going to show you all something. Suppose we take P and we change the first name. That person used to be called Sam. Say we don't really know what we're doing and we set the first name of this to supposedly a brand new person. George and then P dot last name, Roberts. Now let's print the information out again. Or let's append it to the list and then print the person out again. So people list dot add parentheses P. And I'm just going to take this for loop, copy it, and print out the list again. As a matter of fact, to make it blatantly clear that something is wrong, I'm going to comment out this first printing. Because there is a programming error here. So when I run it, check out my four people in the list. George Roberts, Joe Bob, Susan Doe, George Roberts. Now, do you remember what it looked like before? It used to say Sam Hill, Joe Bob, Susan Doe. Now, what in the world happened? Why did this element in the list why did its values change? Because we didn't do anything like this. We didn't say people list dot get element number zero dot and, and don't type this. First name is equal to, you know, Sammy. We, we, we didn't do anything like that. We didn't intend to change the first element of the list. But we did. How did we do that? Because we reuse the object rather than creating a new object. And so, this old object is just out in memory. This original object is out in memory. And when we change the values of it, all it is in the list is a reference to that object. Right? So just like I have three people in a list, right? Or I have three addresses, three home addresses. You know, I have three home addresses in a list. And then... I drive out to that address and I blow the house up. Then when you print the list, or when you go to all the people, all the homes in that list, you're going to find a blown up one. Even though you didn't go to that list and change it, you went outside of the list and actually went to the address of where that was. And then we went over here and we wrote that, that address down again. 
which is what effectively we did, because we added the same memory address, the same pointer. We didn't make a new object. So we have two references, two objects, two pointers that are the same object, and changing one changes the other. So when you're adding things to a list, and this isn't just true of this language, any language where you're using objects, don't reuse the objects. Create new objects in order to insert them into the list. By whatever means necessary. There is even a clone method usually in these objects that you could use in order to copy a new one in. Let's try that. If I did p.clone, is that a valid? No, it's not. All right. Anyways, you better not add the same object multiple times because then you wind up with multiple occurrences of the same thing. And that's not what you want. You want different things. I don't want the same person added multiple times to my array list. Hope that made sense. I think I'm just going to take this one out completely, but I'm going to make a note here that said this actually changes the data in the list because the list is holding addresses to objects. It's not holding copies of the data. Right? If I give you a grocery list, that grocery list does not contain eggs and milk. Right? It contains the word eggs and it contains the word milk. So a list does not contain objects, it contains addresses to object, references to object. So when we print it out again, the first person's name has been changed, even though we didn't expect it. Alrighty, what else could we do with an array list? If we had data in it, printing it out is not the only thing. We might want to sum the data. Well, that's a good idea. Why don't we go ahead and sum the data? We could even write a function, a method that would sum the data, but we could also just put it in line our code. We need to make a new list that contains some numbers. I wonder if there's a fancy way of converting an array to an array list in this language, and I'm sure there is. So convert array to array list in Java. So you use arrays as list. Yeah, give that a shot. We're going to make an array of values. So int, subscript, int, subscript, nums, equals, you know, and then we're just going to put some numbers in there. And yes, we could step through that with a loop, adding each one individually. But I want to try this. I want to try doing array list angle int, int, but I can't do that. Anybody remember from the last lecture why that would be a syntax error? And the answer is that int is a primitive data value, primitive data type, so what would I have to do to fix it? Yep, I'd have to use the wrapper class. Exactly. So I'm going to just call that num list. Is equal to arrays dot to list. Why didn't I see that uh, pop up as I thought I remembered from here? As list, excuse me. All right. Arrays dot as list, and then we're going to pass that array in nums. And arrays is a class, or is it just array as list? Oh, for Pete's sake. It is arrays, so it's a class that needs to be imported. Yep, add import for java.util.arrays. You can save yourself a lot of grief 
by just coming up here and doing import java.util.star. That's going to make that error go away. Right? Nope. Well, I got an error. I need to read this real carefully then and not just look at the Google summary. I thought it was going to be simple. Sorry, guys. Forget it. Forget it. All right. So we're going to make a for loop. Array list subscript integer num list equals new array list angle brackets parentheses semicolon and then for int x colon nums num list dot append x. That aggravates me because I know it'll work. Excuse me, not dot append, that's python dot add. So now we have a list of data. We have an array list of data. Let's do our usual fun stuff and calculate the sum. Calculate the average. So Double sum is equal to zero. And we're just going to write another loop. For int x colon num list. Now this is dumb, right? Because we could have just used nums. Excuse me. We, we could have just used this array to do the same thing. But just, just roll with it. Because what if we couldn't? What if this was declared somewhere else? I'm going to rearrange the code a little bit so that the nums array is not available to us. What I, and I don't care if you do this or not, what I did is I took that line and I declared it inside a brace so that it's out of scope by the time we get down here. And if I tried to do that for every x in nums, I'd get a syntax there. Just doing that to prove that we are actually using the array list because, and this code could have been a function, a method that returned an array list. Could have been somewhere else. So anyway, what are we going to do? We're going to say sum plus equals x. And then we're going to calculate our average. The average is the sum divided by the size of the list. It's dot size, it's not dot, dot length, like it was with arrays and strings. So, double average equals sum divided by num list dot size. Then we could print our stuff out right. System dot out dot print line. print f quote percent s because we're going to print the numbers themselves as a string and then sum equals percent d because we're going to print out the sum and then the average equals percent d and the backslash n and we're going to print the num list comma the sum comma and then the average What did I do wrong? Anybody spot it yet? It's the problem is this in this printf. You should have some and you should have average at least as a percent f. Oh yeah, because percent D does not stand for double. <laughs> Rah! Okay, good job, good job. All right, 
All right, and now it's going to work. Better. That's better. All righty, good. Good, good, good. And there we go. There's our sum and there's our average. And remember that if we tried to print the, the array nums, it wouldn't print it out in this nice little format. It would just print out a memory address. If I went up here and I added a print nums, I don't have to do this. I'm just proving the point. It's not going to look tidy. It's not going to be that series of numbers. Yeah. So, don't want that. Of course, we could do that. We could do a raise.toString and then pass that in. But it's nice just to be able to print the object itself. And what is that doing? Since it is an object, it's calling dot two string on it. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it's doing that. The compiler fixes it so that if it has to be converted to a string, and and it does have to be, then it gets called. Two string gets called automatically anytime an object has to be converted to a string. All right, that is actually honestly as far as I was expecting to take us. What else could I do with number with uh, array lists? We've already talked about how to insert, how to remove things like that. Say we want to get rid of the first number from the array list. What was the method that would do that? Nums dot. Excuse me. Nums num list dot. Was it removed? Yeah, it was. So I'm going to remove one of my numbers. I don't like that 32. But that's not going to work. And I think I covered this last time. Well, let's Maybe see. it will work because these are doubles, not ints. If I did 32.0, it would work. If I do 32, I don't think it's going to. Let's find out. I'm going to change it back to 32, and I'm expecting an error. Why? Because if you just pass in an integer, it thinks that that's the index. And we don't have 32, 33 elements in it. So I'm expecting this to blow up when I try to, to run it. Boom, range check. Here's another exception. All right, so what if I make it a double? Is it smart enough to know that that's a value and not, a, uh, and not an index? Because you can't have a fractional index. Now that worked. Good deal. If it had not worked, I would need to do this. New double parentheses like that. That would fix it. But in this case, since it's not an int, we're good to go. We don't have to do that. I'm going to leave it, though. But I'm going to add a comment. So you wouldn't need to do that new, if this is an array, if this was an array list of integers, you'd do new int, or excuse me, new integer parentheses. And it's not necessary because we're not using integers. But the problem is, is that if it is an int, if it's an array of integers and you pass an integer in, it expects it to be an index value. So for example, if we remove the first element of the list, numlist.remove0, that's index zero, and so when we print it out, that element's going to be gone. What if I want to insert 
a number two, and I want it to. Uh, how about if I want to insert? I don't think it deleted the thirty-two. Okay, here's my thought. Since the list is a list of memory addresses, this is a brand new memory address. So this is not the right way to do it. You would have to just do it like this, I think. That did work, did it not? I'm actually slightly confusing myself by that. Nope, that didn't work either. Well, well, well. I'm going to just get rid of that, all of that, and we're going to delete it by doing that. What is it, the value of my 32? It was the fourth value, so that's 0, 1, 2, and 3. That aggravates me. There's a glitch in my knowledge there. What about strings? I know we saw that work, right? We created an array list of strings. We add two strings to it. And then we're going to try to remove one of those. remove hello and when we print it out we should just see the word goodbye hope that's the case find out yep so it did work this way Apparently, deleting by value is not as easy if it's a, one of those wrapper classes, like integer and double and stuff like that, and I'm not going to take the time. You know what? It wouldn't be that hard to do. You would just have to find the index value that matches it, because you can search the array list and find out its index value. So up here, now I'm going to delete the 4. So I need to find out what index value the 4 is. Or why don't we, instead of doing remove 3, why don't we look for that value? So int index is equal to numList dot uh, I didn't spot it the first time. ArrayList.Contains. Well, this isn't going to work either, and so I need to give up on it. ArrayList.Contains. Oh, that didn't work. Forget it. I'm not going to solve the problem. Next semester students will find out. Sorry guys, y'all can do searches as just well as I can if you're obsessed by it. Well, how about stacks? This will be the last thing we do today. Probably get out a little bit early. Stack of strings. 
ST equals new stack angle brace parentheses and parentheses. I may have mentioned stacks before. I think I have. Have I? Vincent, two. I know you have. I mentioned stacks. No. 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 All right. You know what a stack is, though. Actually, no. stack is just. What does that really mean? If I do this, now there's a, a list, not a list, there's a stack of one piece of paper. I do this, list, the stack has two pieces. Now the stack has three pieces. Now what if I want to start accessing it? I pull off the top piece, the, the last one that was added. It's not like a line, right? If you have a line of people getting into a movie theater, then it's, that is called first in, first out. Right, because it'd be really annoying if you had a line of people waiting to get in the movie theater and then the last person got to go. Right, so that's called a queue. This is a stack. Queues are first in, first out. Stacks are last in, first out. An example of a stack in real life. They're used all the time underneath. All compilers are built on stacks. And they're used all the time underneath everything. You don't necessarily use them all that all when you do application programming, which is what we're doing. But one example of a stack is what if I type something, then I type something else, and then I type something else, and then I go and I type something else, you know, and then I type in something, and I type in... Uh, I'm going to stop talking about that pretty soon. All right. If I hit undo... Which is the first thing that's going to be removed? The last, thing you put in. the last thing I put in will be undone. And then if I hit undo again, the second to last thing. And then the third to last thing. So that's implemented as a stack. Last in, first out. You wouldn't want undo to, t to change the first thing that you did. You want it to undo the last thing you did. So we have a stack here, and I'm going to add a few things to it. Stack dot, some languages call it push. Fortunately, Java does. What are we going to do? We're going to push some colors on it, whatever. Blue. ST dot push orange. ST dot push gold. Now we want to access those values. There's two ways to access the values. If you call dot peak, it tells you what the top value is, but it doesn't change it. It doesn't remove it. That's me, like me going over to the stack of papers and looking at the top one without taking it off. That's yeah. called peak. It's not Pop. recognizing my, the stack that I have it here. That's because I did add java.util.star. Just click on the error and do the add class to it. Good, I need to mention that to everybody. If you typed in stack and you get a red error there, just click on the red error and do add stack. The reason I didn't get that is because I got sneaky and I did import java.util.star, which brought the stack in. Well, so, I, I, before this class, I always used to do that. I always used to have the util.star. I and like doing it. And then after a while, I thought about it. Because when you run Java, it it's actually timed how long it takes for it to run. And when you need, like, will it, if you use star, will it slow it down? Will it slow it down if you import too much? And the answer is no, because that only affects when it's compiled. It doesn't affect the generated code. The generated code is still only going to use a stack and an array list. Okay. The generated code doesn't go and do a search for those classes and accidentally get a whole bunch of others in. Compile time will take a little bit longer, probably. But, you know, that's like a millisecond and you don't compile. But, like, for example, if you're creating a game and it constantly references the imported library. It's still only, on? yeah, yeah. If, if you import everything, then it's still only going to use, the compiler is only going to link to the thing that it needs and it's going to ignore the rest. 
because these okay. these libraries are huge, like the C library and the C++ library is actually absolutely gigantic. So if you do pound sign include and you include a whole bunch of libraries, but you don't actually make use of any of them, it doesn't increase the size of your code. Okay. Yeah. So in the future, is there, as long as you need some of them, you can just star it? Exactly, exactly. It wouldn't be a bad idea if we always did import java.util.star, because isn't that where the scanner is as well? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, they would save us some time if we did that. The only argument against doing that would be if you import too many things, then you don't get an instant view of what the class is doing. Previously, I could open a file, and I would know, oh, we're using the arrays class, and oh, we're using a scanner, because I would see those added to the imports. But honestly, import java.util.star, I ought to teach people just to do that, and then we wouldn't have to be adding them so, so often. Before this class, I used Eclipse, and Eclipse never showed you how long it took for the code to run. Right. And only in NetBeans did it show, does it show you in like 28 seconds. Right. It's kind of neat that NetBeans times the the, the uh, amount of time for you, so that you could do some testing. Right. You could execute a, a loop, you know, 70,000 times and see how long it runs and then change it in a profiling. All right. So I have my stack. I could peek at it. If I called dot peek, it would tell me gold. If I used a for each loop, that's violating the spirit of a stack because you're not doing it for uh, last in, first out, first in, last out, but you would find out that it was blue, orange, and gold. But pop, pop is how you're supposed to access a stack because it removes the last item on it. So like string s1 equals st.pop. String s Two is equal. I'm, I'm going to save some time and do some copying and pasting. String S1, string S2, string S3. And now I'm going to print those guys out. System dot out dot print line. S1 plus a space plus S2 plus a space plus S3. It's going to print out gold, orange, blue. because that's the reverse in which the order they were inserted. What if we do this? What if we pop one thing right here? I'm going to pop right here. I'm not going to even save its value. So before gold, I'm going to pop that. Which one is it going to remove? It's going to remove orange. And so when I print it out, it's going to say blue and gold. And it's also going to blow up, by the way, because there's not three items to pop. It's going to generate an exception. You could fix that. You can check to see that the stack is empty. There's no exception, by the way. Yep. Mm -hmm. Empty stack exception. We want to make sure that the stack is not empty. So the way we would fix that is something like this. If st dot, and I forgot the parentheses. If parentheses st dot empty parentheses in parentheses equals false, or why don't I just do if st dot size parentheses and parentheses greater than zero, then s3 equals st dot pop, and it's complaining because s3 hasn't always been initialized, so I'm going to initialize it to something. I think I'll just put else. S3, this is kind of lame. I should have just commented out the call, right? That would have been the fastest thing to do. Oh, that didn't work. Because I deleted the line that string. All right, tell you what we're going to do. Delete all of this stuff. Delete everything below the last push, and then do this. While st.size parentheses in parentheses greater than zero, angle brace, string s equals st.pop, and then print that string out, system.out.println, quote, stack, pop, 
equals in quote plus s. Then no matter how many or how few people, how many or how few entries are in the stack, that'll work. So is it kind of like your recycling bin, I guess? Yes. When you pop it, mm -hmm. it ought to free the memory because you won't have any references to it anymore. And if it's a huge object that's occupying a megabyte of, of information, that, that's goodness. The garbage collector will clean it up. Okay. All right, that's enough for today. We did use the entire class period. I'm proud of us. So on Tuesday, we'll do file I.O. Something's weird. All right, I'll come look. Let me make the Dropbox so I don't forget to and stop the recording and I'll come help.